Well, good morning, everybody. Here's my plan for today. After talking about some of the recent severe weather and also just getting an update on where we stand this year in terms of severe weather reports, we're going to walk through a little bit about soil moisture. We're going to dig into uh, the upcoming forecast for the next couple of weeks, which is really going to feature a large Bermuda high pump and a lot of moisture into the south and southeast. And we're going to get into then um, some new longer range information that has just been released from uh, the CPC. So we're going to look at the new uh, El Nino forecast, La Nina forecast, and then uh, the response and some of the models to that. But I mentioned we want to start with severe weather. So here is yesterday's unfiltered reports, just looking again at another well, 525 total reports. And a lot of this was in parts of the Northeast where over the last couple of days we've seen quite a bit of severe weather. If I just take you back to yesterday, this would be on the 15th, this would have been the day uh, of the derecho event. Uh, we're now over 870 reports of severe, uh, severe storm damage. And again, when we think about uh, derecho, what that term means, there are some qualifiers to it, and one of them is you need to have damage reports over a five, or excuse me, over a 400 mile span from a uh, from a single storm system, and that's what we had in through here. But this was the second day in a row of really terrible weather for parts of the Northeast, hitting New York as well. And just to show you this morning where those two events have gone through, and then continuing uh, with barrel uh, in the in the power outages down in, in Texas here. We can see that Illinois still has about 100,000 without power. Indiana, about 30,000. Pennsylvania, nearly 100,000. New York, over 100,000 people without power. Uh, most of this due to the, uh, the straight line wind damage from these storms as of late. So if we look at, let's back that off a little bit. There we go. If we look at what July has delivered so far, 127 tornadoes, over 1,800 reports of severe wind damage, and 333 uh, reports of, of hail, uh, bigger than an inch in diameter. And uh, that just kind of puts us um, you know, into perspective here. And a couple of neat things to see with this. Uh, remember, this was the track of barrels. So the, the tornadoes that we're seeing in these areas were from barrel. Then we watched the northwest flow just redistribute um, the atmosphere, giving us the, um, you know, the lift that was needed as we pumped moisture into this, blowing up storms in multiple corridors, again, with that northwest to southeast trajectory. And then this all kind of finishing in parts of the northeast. Just to show you the whole map, though, this is the annual uh, numbers here. So we are currently at 1,412 tornadoes, um, 11,280 severe wind reports, and 4,500 reports of large hail. So that brings me to this. Uh, this is kind of our way by which the Storm Prediction Center keeps just kind of running tally uh, of all of these events. And uh, just fascinating. Now, this is only through July the 15th. Uh, but let's blow this up again just to see a little bit better here. Uh, this is wind, first of all, so we can see our, our wind reports, second uh, in comparison to history here, second only to 2011. 2011 um, is the year. I mean, if you want to compare severe weather, it, it is the year. And uh, we're also second to that in terms of tornado reports as well, but way above the historical average. On the hail reports, this one's just a little trickier to understand because there has been a difference in hail reporting standards after there was the change um, away from the three quarter inch diameter threshold to the one inch diameter threshold, uh, but certainly an active year with respect to hail compared to most recent years, which are shown in these solid lines down here. I was thinking a lot about that just as I was watching the satellite data from yesterday. As I landed, again, more deep convection in parts of the southeast. There's the storm complex rolling through uh, New York, eventually getting over into uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine. And uh, we can see on the back side some cloud cover through here, some smoke, a lot of wildfire smoke in the northwest. And on, on Friday in that video, I'm going to focus a lot on the west and western U.S. reservoir strength and things like that. But uh, just, again, uh, more big storms popping in the central United States, heavy rain flooding from the storms that are along the stalled out frontal boundary here in parts of the Mid-South. And our southwestern monsoon continues to kind of churn around the big Four Corners Ridge, which is something we've been talking about quite a bit. Since we're talking about hail, I did want to show you the last three days of hail um, data. And it's important to note that we do have some radar artifact, which we saw yesterday showing up in the data as well. So remember how the Pennsylvania radar had some odd issues with it. I, d I didn't get a chance to investigate. I had to get on the flight to get to Pier, South Dakota, which is where I am this morning. So, But you can actually see that it has um, pr uh, made for some problems here with the uh, data in the radar. So they'll get that cleaned up. That'll be fixed pro processing, excuse me, um, and fixed in a quality um, control um, 
uh, procedure <laughs> once they get it once they get uh, ready to, to do it but looking at the raw data that's a lot of hail across the country here as of late now earlier this week in my report I put out on Monday um, I talked about the hail that was in Nebraska and I want to show you what I put in that report if we just take a look at some of the new NDVI data uh, this is let's back this out so you can see it hopefully the internet will hold out here I got a kind of a slow connection this morning uh, but what you can see is state of Nebraska, and we're going to focus on this region right here south of the North Platte River, kind of along uh, Interstate 80. So I'm going to zoom back into that area just so you can see where we are geographically. Now the data that are being used here is from the 25th of June through the 2nd of July. But since then we've had some new data, and what I want you to see as I flip this over is this is just raw NDVI data. So if I put the legend on there, you can see the higher the value, the more healthy the crop looks from space. But I'm going to flip this over to the newest data here, which would be from 7.3 to 7.10. And this is going to capture, there it is, the hail event that went right in through this particular area multiple times. Um, this storm produced large hail, which did quite a bit of damage. And I just show that I've, I've just done a quick calculation on how much acres. And I'm, I'm putting it somewhere between about 550 and 600,000 acres of damage based upon just an estimate on this map. Uh, so that's you know over a half million acres that were damaged based off NDVI data uh, here. So I just wanted to bring that back up, something to continue to kind of watch. And this is not, of course, the only place that's seen this kind of damage, but a very clear swath right in through there where the previous week, just go back to it, um, you know, the crop was doing very well in that area. Uh, the reason for the color change is just because this went from late June to early July. So we're getting into more biomass building, a greener plant, and therefore the NDVI values are brighter. Most of Nebraska has been having a, a pretty darn good year so far this year. Okay, back to the precipitation. This is looking over the last week. So we've got a few different things at play here. Uh, this was the moisture from the tropical system, the very weak low that was off the coast, hitting some extremely dry areas in the Carolinas, Virginia. We talked about that earlier in the week. Some of this rain in through here is from barrel. All right. And then on the back side of this, we have the storms coming out of the northwest, rolling around the larger ridge that's in the west. As I look at it, though, we had a lot of area. I'm just going to highlight some of this. Some here, down in through here as well, and pockets throughout the plains that have not received uh, precipitation in the last week while that excessive heat was on. And so we often look at maps like this and see a lot of, of color and, and see a lot of rain, but the reality is there's bigger holes in this than, than our brains kind of quickly interpret. And there have been several places that have really just seen, um, you know, seen some extremely, extremely dry and hot conditions as of late. Now, as I was flying into Sioux Falls last night, so this, of course, is in the southeastern part, um, we got low enough I could get some good pictures uh, of a few things. And um, I noticed a lot of this. So this is just out of the plain window here, but there was a lot of damage like this in fields, which is indicative of kind of early season flooding problems. And I wanted to take a moment just to look at this part of the country by showing you um, the most recent uh, precipitation ranks map. So this would be July uh, by itself showing you how wet things have been in here but that place i took the pictures right here one of the spots that lately has been getting missed by some of the rainfall now before we come back to the midwest here and just look at the impacts of this very wet weather in places i want to note how dry it has been along the appalachian mountains getting up into uh, pennsylvania stretching down here into parts of the south clipping big sections of major ag areas in, in parts of tennessee mississippi alabama and georgia We've had pockets continuing to show up drier uh, in the um, central and southern plains, which aren't reflected on this map as well because of how large the climate reporting districts are. And then the west, which again, we're going to focus a lot on, I think, on Friday, just thinking about how uh, dry and hot things have been there. But I want to come back again to this, this whole section of the country here and just show you that since the start of spring, so I'm going to pick that up at about April 15th. That's what I'm going to call when we got into this spring pattern. We do have places that are right now through July 16th, we are now wetter uh, than any time period in the recorded past, going back to 1893. And so as you just take note here of how exceptionally wet this area is, when I fly home tonight, um, I'll have to look at the flight path, but I hope that I fly over these southern counties in Minnesota uh, and northern Iowa, coming back to Chicago to see if I can see what things look like in there as well. I can just anticipate seeing um, a lot more damage in areas like that. Uh, so just wanted to stress uh, this, this precipitation map, again, capturing spring and now part of summer, uh, looking back from April 15th to July 
uh, the 16th. Our epicenters of dryness, they'll really begin to jump out, and we're going to have to see how that looks in tomorrow's drought monitor update and what the upcoming forecast is going to hold for possibly hitting especially these acres down here with some better rains. Okay, why? Now, let's just make sure that we see where we have been with this pattern. So I'm going to show you all the way back to the 15th uh, of, um, of April where, where the jet stream is preferred be. We've seen larger ridges that have set up here and also here, and we've seen the warm ocean temperatures underneath that. And then our northward displaced Bermuda High for most of spring and summer sitting in that area. So the jet has lived north of this. It's kind of dipped down here and then been forced to run up right through there, racing across parts of Europe. And the trough that you see here uh, in Europe, okay, has come around and put a big ridge that's kept this region in western Russia and like, like most of Ukraine drier. So that's kind of where this pattern has been for so long. So the speed of this jet, which has lived along the U.S.-Canada border, is what's been initiating those storms. It's been far enough to the north that it's kept you know, big sections of the west out of the flow. Uh, and even though there's not been dominant southeast ridging, just taking the jet stream and turning it quickly to the north, we have um, kind of left this area with weaker flow, which is why drought at times has been developing there. So the response in the ocean temperatures is this, right? So we've got these three kind of large regions of very warm ocean temperatures under which we've seen high pressure begin to develop. And that's really, I think, what's dominated the pattern. We look later in this season for the influence of the trade winds on our La Nina region to be a bigger factor once we get into fall and then into winter. But as it stands, that same narrative I've carried for weeks seems to be holding true here. And uh, this, is, uh, this continues, I think, to be our, our main story. Hot Atlantic, very warm kind of regional areas in the North Pacific, and the jet just wants to live north of these areas. So it dips here, and it runs north there, which means western ridges, four corners ridges, Bermuda high flow on the southern side of this seems to be the, the way this pattern's going. So that just brings me back to kind of one last point here. Are we going to continue to see the same regions getting wet and the same regions getting dry? Because as I take a look at the lo uh, latest 40 centimeter soil moisture map, again, that goes down about 16 inches. Now we start to see those pockets of dryness that are deep in the northwest coming into Montana, parts of Wyoming, western parts of the Dakotas. So it was amazing to drive from Sioux Falls to Pier last night, which is on the Missouri River. Uh, just to see the difference from here to here in the crops um, driving along uh, the Interstate 90 there. But take a look at parts of Nebraska, western Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, and then in the Mid-South, Ohio River, and then stretching throughout this part of the Appalachian Mountains, uh, just really keying in on those areas that have missed this. Now, if you ever go to this weather, uh, this website, um, it's a great one. I'll just show you the main page here. It's uh, weather.ndc ndc.nasa.gov sport case studies lists just look zoom in here and you can take a close look i want to show you that you can also choose any of these preferred regions across the top so i always show you the conus the, the continental united states but since i'm in the dakotas i'm going to click on dakotas and it'll change the website hopefully there it goes and we can take a closer look now the variable i pull up is percentile you can look at any of these and they all have value I just tend to show you percentile because it kind of represents a rank compared to historical past. So where I showed you that picture from was here, and where I just drove to was there. So I mean, it's just amazing to see the differences across one state, super wet on one side uh, versus drier on, on the other. Okay, thinking about all of that, I want to show you the latest data I've got from the USGS on where we have flooding rivers. And uh, all of the heavy precipitation that's come into the central Corn Belt as of late we continue to see many of our river uh, gauges here at flood stage or some of them at major flood stage. We have eight at major flood stage, a lot of them right here on the Mississippi River where the big storms just rolled through. But down into Memphis, just wanted to show you this. Uh, at Memphis, the river is still sitting about 15 feet above low stage. And even though there's all that water in the northern and western watershed of the Mississippi, we're not quite getting these high values here. And honestly, the answer to that comes back to this. So if you just take a look at how dry the Ohio River is, we can see that that contribution, which is a huge part of it. I mean, the Missouri and the Ohio are a major reason why the Mississippi River is so huge through the delta here. But it's been quite dry in this area. And I picked up uh, at Evansville, Indiana, what the um, Ohio River has looked like. And so after a dry fall, that was last year, we had some winter flooding, some spring flooding. I mean, take a look at this on April 
19th, the, this particular gauge, 40 feet. But what's happened since then is we're now back down here. And so this is what kind of makes this upcoming forecast so important for this region, just to see if we can recover some of the moisture. So where do we stand today? Well, the heat, the uh, air quality issues, the, 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 but that's all going back west. We have flood watches out for parts of New Mexico, and then here where the storms were yesterday and continue to linger. To the south, we have uh, excessive heat watch, uh, advisory, excuse me, same thing up the east. But as you know, there is a front that has dropped into this area. And by the middle of the day today, this is now color-coded for precipitable water. We can see the much drier air on the northerly flow here running into the flow around the Bermuda High. There's going to be a weak, interesting little uh, low, mesoscale low that shows up here that we're going to have to take a look, closer look at as well. But that's our setup. And that's going to be our setup, I think, for several days. So let's get in and see what it does. Today, Storm Prediction Center's got an eye out on severe storm risk through parts of the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast pockets down here in the Red River Valley at the south, and then coming around the big uh, Four Corners Ridge and the High Plains, the risk of storms. Tomorrow, kind of a similar thing, the front sags, so parts of the Carolinas, which could be very wet in this upcoming forecast, seeing the risk of storms, and same thing again for the High Plains. And then this is the convective outlook um, on uh, day three, which would be the 19th. And I just want to let you know something. I record these videos pretty early in the morning. Um, and normally, right after I finish recording, the Storm Prediction Center will do an update. So remember, at spc.noaa.gov or at agweather.com, ag-wx.com, you can go get the newest maps after I'm done because uh, they did it yesterday. They did it on uh, Monday as well, just right after I finished the upgraded to moderate risk and things like that. So just remember you have those resources. But let's go ahead and have a look at the latest uh, forecast. So here's the rain I just mentioned a moment ago. This is why the flood watches are out for this section of the Mid-South. Later today, severe storms in the Northeast, a lot of scattered storms over a big section of the whole Southeast United States. And then watch the Four Corners Ridge just open up convection on the High Plains here. As we get into tonight, that front continues to linger farther to the South. We'll watch for the remnants of this convection to move out of Colorado, maybe into Nebraska, Kansas, and bigger storms in, in um, New Mexico, which is why they prompted the flood watch in that area. And then as we work our way into um, Thursday and into Friday, I just note that there is this little mesoscale low that's forming on the eastern side of Texas, moving into Louisiana. And that little feature there could produce some locally heavy rains. We're going to have to watch out for that. I'm keeping an eye right here as I play this through. From there, let's go ahead and have a look at our five model update. I've got the uh, artificial intelligence set up first, and it's the same narrative. Large western ridge. Northwest flow initiating storms here. That'll be coming again in the pattern. We have the front that's lingering now and the Bermuda high flow into this area. And that's what's producing the heavy rains down here in parts of the south and southeast. That's echoed in the national blend of models. Okay, again, you can see the drier air coming in now, but there will be storms initiating in this once we get past the next few days. That's the main narrative here but potentially very wet across some of the driest spots in the country, which is why we analyzed those ranks earlier. This would be the WPC forecast. Again, now you can see better chances of those storms in the plains, and this will try to fill in soon. I, see, I think that's better represented in the European. See it starting to come back into this area, but our wettest conditions farther to the south. And the GFS, I think, is most generous with returning uh, that, that moisture. Now, normally I try to walk you through the models, <clears throat> but this morning I um, had to rerun the ECMWF and it just didn't finish by the time I wanted to record. So we'll just uh, we'll get to that um, like back in normal step with tomorrow. But I think it's good just to take a moment here and see the pattern and see the probabilities just to get a, a handle on this. So here's that story. All right. So there's our Four Corners Ridge, which extends up into western Canada. This is where the front just came through behind that low. And here's our Bermuda High. So one of the reasons why we're going to see so much wet weather in this area is because of this flow, the interaction of the front and the Bermuda High working with it. Now, it's not every day, just nonstop. You see, as we go to the weekend and it's early next week, the pattern's still there, but it will break apart. And at some point mid next week, we're going to get a little bit of a shift in this as a ridge tries to come back into this area. But as I play this out farther, you know, we just see the pushing of this ridge into this area. There's still the Bermuda High here. What will be interesting is by the time we get toward the end of this month, this is the kind of setup with this trough coming through that initiates storms that will like to run over the top of this 
hitting this area once again. So we'll keep an eye out on that. But in the near term over the next 10 days, here's the probability of getting um, an inch of rain. Now note, I, again, I, I still believe there will be storms coming through this area, not in the near term because of the dryness of the air, but they're gonna return back to this region pretty soon. But it is wettest as you get right into this area and then definitely across the south. And if I flip this up, let's see. Uh, darn, we got a new model run in. The new European Ensemble just started. So let me take you back out there. There we go. That's the probability over the next 10 days of two inches. And if we look for the really wet areas, this is the chance over 10 days of four inches. So this is really gonna beat back some of the drought that's been developing in that area. What about the week two? No surprises here, this seems to be the same kind of pattern, but do you see this? This is what I'm talking about. We're starting to see the increase of the storms back in this area in addition to all of that flow coming around like this, all right? So that, that narrative has remained unchanged. So let's talk what the temperatures are gonna do because already today we can see how that front sag through it was beautiful last night driving with the windows down through parts of South Dakota. Much cooler air while the heat is in the northwest right now. So hot south, major front coming through. By Wednesday, it's getting farther to the south. Excuse me, by Thursday it is. Here it is on Friday, working our way into Saturday. Whoop, real quick there. There's Saturday into Sunday. Much cooler air in the central United States while the heat goes back into the west and stays there. And then we work our way into Monday and Tuesday, and it's kind of the same narrative. And that's what happens when you have a large four corners ridge. We just pump the heat here. And as we get the moisture coming in, some of this is induced by cloud cover and rain that's keeping the south as cool as it is. And then on the northern side, we have the drier, cooler air still around through this weekend. So day five through 10, no surprises here. It's been very consistent all week. Day 10 through 15, looking similar. And the European model, that's day five through 10. It's got the same kind of progression, day 10 through 15. Now, what we'll be watching <clears throat> once we get out there into August is you note this in the model. There are some indications that we could be bringing in a more open ridge into the midsection of the country, uh, but we're gonna have to watch for the evolution of that as we go forward. I think it's just an artifact we're starting to see right now in the European. There is some reason to see it, but I'll be covering it more in the next couple of videos as we work our way into more detailed forecasts in August. So let's get into the end of this, which is just a quick update on the hurricane season. We expected things to be quiet over the next seven to 10 days. The National Hurricane Center map still showing nothing developing. I was out there looking at some satellite data this morning, but maybe I can show it to you better yesterday. This is all of that Saharan dust we keep talking about in each one of these videos showing up on satellite pretty clearly here. But what I think is gonna happen is that um, as we look over the next 15 days to start August, if we start to get any sort of a slant and where these upper level rising pattern is versus the sinking pattern, this will begin to shift and start to invigorate a, a more conducive atmosphere to getting rising motion over the tropical Atlantic. And if that starts to take over, we will then get ourselves into a scenario where the hurricane season is gonna make a, a jump again. As it stands, no big changes in this longer range outlook for the month of August. I still think it's gonna be a play on the two major high pressure cells that flank North America and where we expect lower pressure to form to the south of it, that's where we're gonna be seeing our active hurricane season and the displacement north of the Bermuda High and the Pacific High. So what we get out of this is the same outlook. So if I come in here and look at a 30-day precip anomaly, it's been the same, it's been consistent all along with this forecast. Again, don't turn this into kind of a binary map with yes rain, no rain. This is more of um, a drier pattern, but there will be storms that erupt in this. That, that, that just happens in summer given the pattern we've currently got. From there, I do wanna show you that the CFSV2 is similar. So if you, I'm gonna show you the smaller thumbnail maps now, but you can see that the week one and week two look very much like I just showed you, but it's the week three, week four. On the temperature side of it here, notice the warmth coming back in to finish the month. I think that's pretty consistent with, uh, with what we saw from the ECMWF. And then you can also see that while there could be some dryness in the interior, storms are running the periphery of this in both the week three and the week four, which gets us out there to mid-August. So we start to see some consistency here with some of the models. But that brings me to the last couple of things. And the first is NOAA did release um, a couple of days ago its new forecast for La Nina. And as you can tell, throughout winter, they're expecting it to reach a peak in its influence, probably October, November, December. Uh, where it has its highest probability of forming over an 80%. But notice June, July, August, even July, August, September, 
we're in inso neutral conditions according to the CPC probability forecast, which is what we've been discussing. What this is, what are you waiting on? If, you, if you're waiting on La Nina, you're waiting on trade winds. That's it. I mean, that, that's what's driving this. It's a coupled system. It's the atmosphere and ocean working together, but you're waiting on strong trade winds. So what? when we look at all of those probabilities, I just want to let you know that NOAA, using the Columbia University's IRI Center, okay, they are combining numerous models, both statistical and dynamical, to give us that prediction. And most of them are settling this into a kind of a, a weak La Nina situation. There are a few of the ensemble members that drop this down into stronger, but it appears right now half degree below normal uh, it would be what, what to expect out there in Nina region 3.4. Now that's not the only spot we watch, of course, but it's one of the main ones that we'll continue to observe. So their resulting forecast, and this is where I'm going to finish today, looks something like this. So I'm going to show you the whole planet. I think this is valuable to see all of this at once. If we get into a La Nina-like situation, August, September, October, that's going to push stronger trade winds here, get us our best rising motion over Indonesia and Australia, hence the highest probabilities of being wetter. Now, this is going to be very interesting for the Americas because at this point, remember, early September, we can start to plant a crop down here in Brazil. I can't believe we're beginning to have that discussion right now. And there could be some lingering dryness from the summer dry time period, excuse me, the winter dry time period uh, down here in Brazil that has to be discussed. Uh, notice the consistency with the other forecast models with drier conditions in the central United States showing up. That's looking out there August, September, October. What about September, October, November? The dryness you see spreading across the southern tier of the U.S. Uh, is important <clears throat> because that would be typical of a developing La Nina should this happen. But this is a bit baffling. Normally, La Nina conditions tend to produce better early season rains down in Brazil. In other words, an on-time start to the monsoon. And right now, the models are suggesting that it's a bit late. Maybe by October, November, December, it's going. But this dryness being forecast here is kind of sitting over like the southern Amazon, northern growing areas of the Cerrado, like Mato Grosso. So I'm going to watch that carefully. But as you get into October, November, December, this, <clears throat> this look, this is La Nina to the T. Dry south more active north, colder north, warmer south. I mean, that, that'll be something we'll have to watch out for. So we'll just keep building that narrative with time, but I'm going to wrap it up here and start getting this video uploaded. It might take a little while given the slowness of the internet, but we'll, uh, we'll pick up again tomorrow morning. Talk to you then. Thanks.